What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of Bad Decisions Coffee Break. Damn right. Let's clink that. For today, oh, yeah. we got Lavazza right here, and did you, did you put peanut butter? Yeah, in the because <laughs> why the fuck would you do that, man? Because I, I I put every single thing in the coffee machine, and you know it looks so empty. I was like, okay, we already look like a scam podcast <laughs> right now. <laughs> let, let me you... put some peanut butter box to make it look full, so now it looks legit. It was your fault. We made a deal. We were like, when we get the coffee, make sure you don't take everything out of the box, so that when we are having the podcast, we can actually show it. But this guy went and emptied <laughs> everything, and now we have to put this fake peanut butter inside to make it look good. So, just to let you guys know, we are drinking Lavazza today. Did we, we had this on the podcast? Yes, we time. had it. We had it one time before. It's, exactly. it's a good coffee, but it's about to finish. We're going to get a new one. So, by next time, we're going to be going to Granville Island. If you guys are in Vancouver, you know where that is. They have amazing range of coffee there. I'm so stoked to try one of them. Like I They had wait. 10 different types. I'm going to go and tell them. I want the one that makes me zooted as fuck. I, I really want to try that. I can't fucking wait. They had like 10, 20 types. So the next time we promise new coffee and good packaging. Yes. Don't. Yes. I'm just going to put this aside because it, it looks fake to me. It has <laughs> peanut butter in it. But Farha, today is a very special episode. We had our first guest on the podcast in the last episode, Dodds was here. Big shout out to Dodds. And today we got somebody new. Um, I've, I'm excited to meet him. You've talked to him previously. You got to tell people who he is. So I'm very excited to have him on our show. I reached out to him actually, actually two weeks ago and told him, hey, I really want you to be on the podcast because he's a motion designer. Yeah. And then he, he now he has his own studio focusing on augmented reality based all the way in New York. And the thing about augmented reality studio, there are not many of them out there. And there are not many of them who work with big brands. That's he right. has worked with Pepsi, Disney, Marvel, ESPN. It's crazy. And I think he has a lot of story to tell us and he yeah. has a lot of valuable information. So I'm super excited to welcome Alex to our show. Alex, how are you doing, bro? What's up, Alex? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 love them. Oh, 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 Alex, you were supposed to pop out of the screen. We <laughs> made it. We had a deal. Alex, oh, let's go. go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'm sorry, Alex ruined the show. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, sorry, guys. I, I drank too Alex. much coffee, and I thought that was what the show was based on. But yeah, not. I love the energy, Alex. Actually, what kind of coffee do you drink? Is it like americano, latte? Do you mix it with milk, or how what's, do you like what's your, your coffee? thing? You know, I love doing a nice V60 pour over. Um, oh. I, I haven't done it as much lately, but I used to really weigh the, the beans. I felt like I was uh, in a meth lab. Like it had all <laughs> the little grinds, finessing oh. it. The coffee that I like the most is it's a bit of a deep cut for you guys, but double shot coffee in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Most people don't think of Oklahoma as anything. When they think of coffee, I, yeah. I will tell you that that coffee is the best coffee I've had, and I haven't had anything that's matched it. Um, wow! Is it, is it the flavor, itself? or is it the flavor, or the energy? What was it that you liked so much? You know, I think what I, I'm trying to put it together because I've done a lot of coffee in New York and coffee in California, and I think it's just how much grounds they put into it. In Oklahoma, they're just sense. making motor oil. Like that they're makes just putting it in there. Sense. It's it's a thick cup and when you drink it you are just flying for the day wow i really want out some I, of that coffee you know, know it's, it's it's a drug man it's 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 a freaking drug and we need to accept that i'm always looking for the stronger version of this drug like whoever can give me the strongest version like if you watch breaking bad there was that 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 well that 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 snow that mr white made that was like pink and it was the strongest the cleanest that's what i'm looking for so whoever can find me that in coffee terms wins my heart yeah, and and I, I love the story of the owner himself. He actually like will go to the farms and like smuggle back coffee in like a suitcase because there's all these weird like international laws. But he's all about just like finding the best beans. He told me he used like firecrackers once to like break them open just to like try wow. something. New. I love these. But he's stories. like a mad I... scientist. Dude, we should try. We, we need to figure out if we can find any of these here in Vancouver. I I'm really sure want to try is. that. I'm sure there is. And the thing is, the more you go into it, the deeper the hole goes. I'm sure there's people just doing crazier shit with coffee every day. And uh, honestly, like we are calling ourselves Bad Decision Coffee Break, but we're still very early into this 
business. Noob, we are coffee. noobs, yeah. We we drank shit coffee for most of our life, but we still <laughs> drank it. You know, we still drank it on the like cooking it on the pot, like literally. <laughs> right? Student days, student days. I was like that. That's the way. Because we just needed energy for the exams. Hey you know man, what there's I mean? nothing wrong with that. I got the the, I, there's a place called Stop and Shop that's like a grocery store, and that's that's the coffee I'm drinking right now. So <laughs> I'm not a purist in any sense. Yeah. No, no. It, it's all good. It's all about honestly. I feel like for most people, like coffee is just about getting you through the day and making sure you can function the way you need to function if you're trying to put in the work and put in the hours if you're working through the night. So I think coffee's main reason is that. Anything above that is just us trying to be fancy, having that nice flavor and all that. So as long as you get the energy, you're good. Yeah. But we're not here for coffee today, guys. We're here for something else. Alex got a lot of story to tell us. And Farad, again, you've been super pumped to talk to him. So I, why don't you be the first person to even break this open? I, I, I really want to start with his studio back in New York. It's yeah. called Mouse Pack. And I'm really fascinated by the name. How did you come up with the name Mouse Pack in the first place? So it was started in, uh, it's an old brownstone, actually, the home that I used to live in uh, before I just moved recently, like a month ago. But it was a really cool historic house. It's one of the three remaining in the neighborhood that used to be farmland. Um, What was really cool about the house is that it had a backyard and a front yard, which is super rare in New York. But what that also invited was a lot of mice. And we did best job we could to keep them out we plugged all the holes but there is just these little cracks little crevices everywhere and there's mice and we thought they were cute and that's when i named the company mouse pack because at the time we had a, a small team of a few developers a few artists and we were a little small but mighty force so i'm like thinking of something cute and small but that can also be friendly so i went with mouse pack Unfortunately, the this, became way more of a nuisance after that. This is the best story I've ever heard. This is yeah. the best story I've ever heard for a company name. This yeah. is this is fucking great. This is so. I insane. love it. I mean, there's there's history to that, right? Yeah. And it's funny that it was cute and then it turned out to be annoying. Exactly. But the name is there, and and the name means something to you, and I think that's the best part. Yeah, yeah, and I think honestly, I mean, this company's great. I wouldn't do anything else. But I think it's also a good tie-in to how cute and fun starting a company sounds and then the reality of it when you have to actually do the work, you know? I, I think that that says a lot. And I think, again, we, we chose bad decisions as well for our, our studio. And the reason we did that is because when we quit our jobs and left everything to start whatever we're doing now, it was a bad decision. Like most of the things we've done in our life that turn out to be good started as bad decisions. But I I feel like we want to sort of amplify that story to everybody as well, that you have to make bad decisions in life. And those are the ones that actually make you fail, but then learn and succeed later on. So this is why we started with bad decisions as a name. And I appreciate when we see other studios also come up with names that actually have a history. I always think that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I love your email too. Make bad decisions. It's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like we had to be smart about it, right? Like if if you could make it funny as well. So every time someone's reading the email, they're like, make a bad decision. Make make a a bad decision. You know, it's, and I feel like that stands out. So I think we made a pretty good choice. Yeah, and already we we set the expectation with everybody who works with us. Already a bad decision. Don't expect too much. You know what? Like (laughs) when we name ourselves bad decision and the email is make a bad decision, you cannot not expect much from us it's, it's gonna be a crazy ride yesterday i said i'm going on a podcast and they're like what, what's it called and i said bad decisions and they said <laughs> <laughs> are you sure you want to go there man i don't, I don't know you need to think about that again yeah um speaking of employees let's 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 talk about you a little bit and your history because i think for a lot of people they want to know who you are and what you do we are already aware that you own a, a an ar a creative studio that focuses mostly on ar why don't you tell us well, let, let's break you down a little bit. Let's go all the way back, right? When you first started, I'm not sure if you, you know, finished college, university, and then went to work freelance in motion design. Maybe tell us a little bit about how you actually started working. What was your, like your first career like? Yeah, sure. Um, I got involved in motion graphics uh, pretty early on. I would say right before I went to college. Before that, right. I was really interested in film. I wanted to be a director. 
Um, and over the summers, I would put together these short films, these zombie films, right? So I'd get a few friends, okay, you're a few actors, and then I got to write a script. And then we have to go to location. And I'd go around to places around town. I'm like, hey, do you mind if we just film for like an hour or two? And it was always <laughs> such a mess. It was always such a logistical nightmare. I had this idea in my head of what I wanted, but it was just so challenging to execute, to get every all the pieces to fall into place. And that's when I found animation, where I could have the idea, wouldn't it be cool if a turtle had a jetpack? And then I could just do it. So yeah. I, I did a lot of online learning, a lot of mostly YouTube, learning how to use After Effects. And that was my main weapon of choice. Um, and I would use that to, uh, my heart was really for nonprofits. So uh, American Red Cross was actually one of the first clients, I would say. I didn't actually get paid for it. But I asked them, like, hey, what types of things would you like to get awareness on and how can I help? And they would talk about donations and how they want to put out videos that can help people to understand where their donations are going and how they can help. So it really unlocked a whole new world for me of, like, storytelling and being able to do the process of film, but at a faster rate and at a way more creative, um, just very creative way of doing things. So I, I started to do that more and more, and I, I, of course, wanted it to be a career and not just a hobby, so I started reaching out to people on Facebook. Uh, if, do you know Pez, the candy company? The little I, dispensers? No. Oh, oh, the, the, the one that you, you all put in like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my first clients was Pez. I actually animated their logo. I just went in to After Effects, cranked away at a few keyframes here and there, and I sent it to them. And I wait, said, wait, wait. How did you get them? Did you message them? Or, like, did you do the work and show it to them? Like, because I'm always curious how people get their first job. Sometimes the they first create... Deal, yeah, yeah, the first deal. How, how, yeah, yeah. Break, break it down. How did, how did you get it? I animated their logo without talking to them. They were in the... They were near where I grew up in Orange, Connecticut. So I'm originally from Connecticut. And we had gone to the visitor center. It's sort of like a Connecticut staple. So I'm like, oh, man, it would be so cool to work with them. So I just downloaded a picture of their logo off the Internet. I chopped it up and decided to animate it however I thought it could animate. And I sent it to them on Facebook. I found just My Pez message. message Hey, check this out. Do you like this? This is so smart. This is so smart. And, and I know it's wor it works because we have tried that before. And a lot of creators, a lot of people that I see that I, they want to get in and they don't know how to get in. They are always waiting for the client to come to them or they don't make anything because they think it's a waste of time. But I have seen this work a lot of times. And when you are saying that, I'm super pumped. And you know, like it works. You do the things for free. You spend some time. They will like it because if you go and pitch it to them, hey, I'm going to take your logo, do this, do that. Probably without any background or history, they're not going to take it. But when, you're, when you have done the work, they will see. They're like, oh my God, wow, I need this. I want this. Yeah, I mean, of course you need to figure out what amount of work you're willing to put up with for free because obviously if you're just doing free work all day and you're maybe not sending it to the right people or people who don't have a problem to begin with that you're offering a solution to, it's just a waste of time. So it, sure. there's a lot of finesse that's involved in that. And I mean, over that was over a decade ago and I'm, I'm still figuring that process out. <laughs> Um, it's it's a long it's a long journey. It's not a, it's it's a never ending journey because even as you grow up and and you grow in the business world, there's always bigger clients to go after. There's always bigger businesses to go after. So that concept still remains all the way to the end. It's just how you it, it just scales up essentially. It just gets more complex. But I I also want to just touch on what you and Farhad were saying. I think what you said is beautiful. It's a testament to how I've seen any successful business work. Most of the time, it's cold DMs, cold messages, cold emails that they send out and they do the work for free. But just like you said, I don't think everyone has unlimited amount of time. I think as long as you're smart about who you're choosing, you know these people need a better logo or you know these people can use your skills, tell them, show them. Right, that's the trick, and and I feel like a lot of people fail to do that. I see so many artists on Instagram that have amazing skills, and I know they're looking for jobs. I know they're looking to you know grow and and scale and work with brands, but they never actually reach out to any brands. Or the stuff that they're working on 
is very, very personal. Like it's just their style of art, which is great. I'm encouraging that. I think it's good to be unique. But yeah. I think to first start out, it's also good to market yourself, to also try new things that you know the, the world kind of wants. And just going back to your story, so you, you DM them, you emailed them at the time, and what did they say? Did they immediately accept it? They were like, yeah, let's do it. How did well, it work? Originally, they were like, oh, so do you want us to put your artwork on our website for free? Like they were kind of seeing what they could get yeah. out of me. And I was yeah. like, well, I, I would love to actually work with you and figure out what problems you're trying to solve. And I, I, I don't remember the exact wording. I'm sure it wasn't that elegant. But um, <laughs> at the time, they were, honesty. yeah, they were promoting a new candy product and uh, it was just an innovation project, you would call it. So mm. it wasn't the dispensers. It was a little soft gummy that they were selling. Mm. And they said, we want to get this in front of people. We want to show people this new product. And we have uh, it's gluten free. It's vegetarian and I don't know, fun. I forget what the third, but they have yeah, fun. <laughs> And they said, go ahead and make us a commercial. That was it. Right. There was no creative. They just gave me the, the little gummy bear, like a little icon. And they actually, I was yeah. in college at the time. And they sent me three boxes full of these candies. Oh, and my dude, my God. Was, I was so popular in my dorm. <laughs> I can imagine. just kept coming back and they just knew me as like the candy dealer, you know? Candy dealer. Guy. Hey, hey, me, past midnight, someone come knocks on the door. Hey, can I have a bar of candy? Probably some guys were smoking joints who were high and they were just like, they were just having the munchies. They were like, oh, it's the candy guy. Candy guy. I remember there was a dude who walked into my room, didn't even say hi to me and grabbed a bag of candy and, the and I was like, what is this? Like, what the fuck? Put some respect on this candy. Yeah, yeah. But, but like, what's going on? Honestly, like, what, I wouldn't like, judge him. If I saw one guy with three boxes of candy, I would have done the same. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I hey, I told everybody I have a bunch of candy and they ate the candy and they loved it. But so that kind of set me up. I, I, I did the voiceover for it where I was like, hello, would you like to buy some candy? You know, and recorded that i had a buddy who did music to do the soundtrack for it i did all the animations and after effects i did the storyboards and i just fell in love with that process it was so fun and it was just i felt so engaged and so alive and then when the when the video went out it was just such a such a moment of pride for me but also being able to see that i can take something from just a few key words and create an entire video, which is something I would never be able to do with a film. I would have to yeah. get the cameras and hire the crew and find the location. And it was just very freeing to me. Uh, I find that fascinating. And one thing I want to talk about is I talk to a lot of people and I've heard from people who want to make it, right? make it whatever that term means you know the definition of make it is different for everybody for some people that's working with the first brand for some people that's getting a million dollars it's it's different but in this situation let's call making it as starting a career out of your passion and this is like a big big sort of layer that everyone needs to penetrate as artists and and honestly not even artists fields. any other fields yeah exactly so i know a lot of people who want to sort of penetrate that field when you're talking about this specific case, that first brand that you worked with that you were proud of and you saw this process, before that, have you made a lot of efforts or a lot of attempts, failed attempts perhaps? Or was this like, you know, that was like sort of your first one that you went all in and it worked out perfectly for you? Because I feel like a lot of people have like maybe 99 tries that fail and the hundredth one hits. Some people might have only two fail and the third one hits. It's very different for everybody. Well, I can tell you what the failure for me was trying to pursue film as a career. And I decided to okay. pivot to motion design. I had been mm -hmm. trying to sell people on doing commercials for them. I uh, worked at a, a, a golf course when I was growing up. So I remember I'd go to the pro shop and be like, hey, can I film, you know, your golf instructors and maybe put that out on social media? And they were like, eh. And it just, <laughs> this was at the time when the iPhone was just taking over and there wasn't really as much of a need for it. I was doing some wedding videos, but I just, it wasn't very creative to me. Wasn't and it was clicking very with stressful. you. Um, but I, as time went on, I, I, I did a motion graphics video. And like I said, for the American Red Cross, which is not paid, 
Um, but I did a video for them in Premiere Pro, which is a nightmare to do an animation in. Yeah. <laughs> that was all I knew. Um, and I did that and I got a lot of reception. People at Red Cross loved it and they wanted me to do another one. And it was the first time someone actually wanted me to create something for them rather than me trying to sell it to them and trying to get them into a product that honestly, I didn't think they wanted. That's, that's, that's fucking great. And now you have, you have done motion, motion design for a couple of years, I assume. And how did augmented reality came, became a part of it? Because, you know, for doctors, they study medicine. For lawyers, they study law. For augmented reality, I never found a straight line path for anybody. Like somebody discovered it by accident. The other person was a designer. But how did it come about for you to, you know, do motion design and then now doing AR? Yeah, so I did motion design for 10 years after that. I got a job at uh, a company called LinkedIn, which I'm sure you guys oh, know about. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, from LinkedIn? there, what I actually LinkedIn? worked at Snapchat as a motion designer. And that's when I started wow. to see them starting to trickle into the world of AR. I was always fascinated with what's next. I understood that motion design was cool, but in the same way of film, I knew eventually it's going to have to adapt to something else. And before, before my job at Snapchat, I was really interested in pursuing Unity, doing research into it, but it was just so daunting to me. I was an animator. I liked making characters' arms move around. But when I see giant blocks of code, my eyes just <laughs> feel like the back of my skull. Um, so when I was at Snapchat, that's when I, I talked to one of my friends, Will Galperin. He was a creative, uh, creative at the time. And he saw one of, I had a little bouncing acorn. And we had some time in between projects and I showed him the acorn. He's like, oh, that's really cool. Have you thought about putting that in AR? And I was like, I mean, what? I would love to, but <laughs> I just, like, you know, I don't, I don't know, know how I could do that. And that sounds like a lot of work. And he's like, just try it out. Here's Lens Studio, right? It was like a commercial for Lens Studio. And I just imported the FBX and it worked. And I had that eureka moment. It was the same moment when I was able to get that Pez project of like, oh my goodness, I can do AR. And it was so, it, it just opened my eyes to it. And I started making a lot more 3D animations that I would put into that. And I would start to get the views, which of course feels really good. Hits that spot yeah. in your brain that makes you feel like you're doing something important. The dopamine hit is crazy. Yeah, you yeah. know. So I, I started doing that more and more. And I just was fascinated with what's next. How do I make this better? How do I make it more interactive? How do I keep up with the generations below me? Um, I, that's something that's always been driving me is, of course, motion design was really cool, but I see the era of clicking just a, a play button. It's going to die, you know, like people yeah. aren't just going to click a play button and sit there and drone out. Kids have way too many options. They're on Fortnite. They're on Roblox. They're constantly interacting with everything. And that's what really drew me to AR is you can do the animation, but kids can play with it. They can interact with it. I love how forward looking you are and how you don't get comfortable at what you do. And you're always looking for what is next. I think that is, that is really a, a true, I would say, DNA of an entrepreneur. So you can really look out at what is next. Sometimes that next thing might not be a thing, but at least you're yeah. trying to experiment things. Actually, I, I just want to touch on that as well because I think it's beautiful. We, we talk about it, the concept of pivoting, right? Because when we first started out, we were thinking about, okay, when we set out our direction to be this, we have to stick to this. And it's, it's shameful to like after a month come and say, you know what, that was the wrong decision. Like we, we made a decision to start with this. Let's just keep this going. But through the time, we realized, actually, you might have to pivot once every few weeks, you know, change your direction because you might make horrible decisions and you might have to keep changing that. And I want to talk about your decisions. So you were in film, then started motion design. Then from motion design, you went into AR. I'm sure you're still interested in all of these domains, but you realize at a certain point, you know what? Maybe this is not the right thing for me. Maybe I need to pivot. How 
tough was it for you to make that decision? I mean, you sound very excited about that decision, but I realize at that very point, it's still a very hard decision to make because you think your whole career and life depends on that previous thing. But now you need to make a complete switch, learn a completely new software. You have no idea if the market or your friends or your family or, you know, anybody's going to be supportive of you. So I'm sure it was tough to make that decision at the time. What motivated you or inspired you to make that click? You know what? I'm going to fucking switch. You know, I do my pivots very slowly. And that's something that I've, um, I think has caused the success that I've had is that I test things before I fully jump into it. There's obviously now, you know, things pop up and NFTs pop up and then the metaverse pops up and I see people are just so quick to embrace it and just be like, I'm the chief NFT metaverse officer, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> NFTs of yesterday, be, AI of tomorrow. <laughs> you have to be very critical of what is that product First of all, if it's cool, that's exciting. If it gets you excited, that's cool. But I did not make the jump into AR until I knew that there was a business and a revenue behind it. I, at the time, I worked. Uh, I was working at Google during the day, doing a lot of 2D motion design. I actually introduced them. I'm like, have you guys thought about doing Instagram? You can do interactive campaigns, interactive ads. And they're like, oh, we haven't done that before, but we were definitely willing to try. And once we did it, everybody wanted it. The whole company was like, we want that. We want it for our event. We want it for our event. And it was really cool. I was like, okay, Google wants it. Snapchat, at the time, they were trying out different, they were trying Snap Films. They were trying the, the AR. But I, I saw Snap Camera pop up and I'm like, okay, I definitely see where this is going. So I, I would do at nighttime, I would, um, I'd, I'd just put a lot of time into, I'd, you know, I'd come home and I'd, I'd find a few friends who are also interested in figuring out this new weird world. And I'd get some friends who are developers and I would do a lot of the creative uh, and a lot of the asset creation. And I would start to get freelance jobs. So obviously I couldn't really take too many so I would yep. just take one or two that I could do at night or early in the morning. Um, but it started to get to a point where I'd get more and more and more. And I was like, I just, I can't quit my day job though, because it's, it's money. It's guaranteed money. Yep. I was yep. making pretty good money and I really didn't want to have to give that up. But I, I talked with my, my lovely wife and I was like, this, I think we can make this work. I think I can sell some of the stock that I had on LinkedIn and use that as just a foundation to build this. And I'll just go freelance, like how I've been doing freelance in the past. And over time, I, I did that. I took some 2D motion freelance jobs and some AR jobs and just slowly decided to make it all AR jobs. And I think that was the most challenging part was I wasn't sure if AR was a mature enough field. I didn't know if there was actually enough money behind it or if I just got lucky with a few good jobs. But as I tested it and as I went forward, I saw that there was more jobs and more jobs. And I'm like, I need to just brand myself as augmented reality because that is what I'm passionate about. That's what I want to be doing. I can do the 2D motion, 3D motion jobs. But if I focus and I just concentrate on augmented reality i know i can build an augmented reality studio that i'm proud of that that's that's great that's really fascinating and this is where mousepack came about right mousepack came about when you wanted to focus on ar and when you quit your job and started your own studio right yeah mousepack was it was more of like a project i would call it early on i I'd always really wanted to have an animation studio that was a dream of mine um so when I first started Mousepack, it was just a collection of a few mm -hmm. friends just working on some projects. The first project was actually Box Boys, which was uh, this little game with these little these little characters with little box hats. They shoot out of a cannon, um, but it took us way too long to do. We're <laughs> like, we're just going to make a game. It's going to be fun. And five months later, we finally launch it. And it was so... It took so much effort, but it was that process that I mentioned of Pez, where you go from the storyboard to the development to the final creation. And 
I was just so proud of that final creation that I'm like, this is something. I don't see a lot of this attention in augmented reality. I see a lot of people do quick little face effects, uh, yeah. maybe a quick filter on their face, but I don't see the passion and the energy that someone would do for a short film or an animation studio would do for these self-funded projects. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And actually one thing, I don't know if, I, if you have any questions based on this, because I, I actually want to talk to you about sort of where AR is right now since you brought that up. Because it is true, most of the augmented reality that we look at today is face filters, right? And and rightfully so because a lot of people use it, right? A lot of people use the makeup filters or there's event filters or there's the super popular anime or Disney, you know, face filters that completely change your face. I, I love those filters yep. when they came out. But we know, especially us three here talking as people who created AR experiences, that AR can be much more than that, right? It can truly enhance many different experiences in the world. But it's still, in my opinion, in its baby stages because not a lot of people have awareness of the capabilities of AR. Now, we're at a stage where there is, of course, Instagram, there's SnapLens Studio, Eighth Wall is there as a web AR platform, and they're releasing their new updates. Snapchat brought in ray tracing, Eighth Wall with the sky, sky segmentation plus ground. You share that on LinkedIn as well, so you can have a drone fly in and then boxes drop with the physics on the ground, so it hits the floor, it collides with the floor. Lots of cool stuff happening. There's TikTok with Effect House, which we were just discussing because it's weird. They are, you know. Pushing, push they're trend. pushing it, but if TikTok gets banned, they're suddenly out because, like, you know, the entire US won't be able to use TikTok, and that's like I would say 150 million users, users just in US. Yeah, yeah. But just generally speaking, this is where we are with augmented reality. What do you think about augmented reality now versus where it was when you first got into it? What do you think about the growth? Do you think the growth is fair? For augmented reality, or do you think it should be way more than that? Do you think uh, way more people need to be involved in it? And where do you see the future of AR as well going forward? Sure. Well, I think AR is definitely in a much better place than when I first started. When I first started, Lens Studio didn't, didn't exist. Spark AR didn't exist. Um, nothing existed except Unity. And I think the barrier to entry was so high that there really wasn't that many people doing anything at all. So... With these social AR platforms coming out, I think there's a huge benefit to the shareability of it. Being able mm -hmm. to take a video and send it to people, obviously people love taking pictures of themselves. So mm -hmm. I understand why face filters have been blowing it up. What I want to see with AR is I really want to see it grow naturally. I, do, I didn't love the NFT scene. When people were showing the NFT scenes, then all of a sudden everybody was doing it and everybody had their own version of it and it grew way too quickly and it wasn't organic yeah. to me and then it collapsed. And what I see with AR is I see a slow, gradual curve up and that's what I really enjoy. So I, I want to make sure that people are putting the time and energy into crafting their AR filters to making sure they could be the best they can be and not just going for views. I obviously think if you're selling to brands and they want to make sure that the ad campaign is gonna be successful, you obviously need to be focusing on how many views it's gonna get and what the retention is. But the projects that I self-fund and the projects I do on the side are really to push the whole medium of AR forward. I wanna to get to a future where people go outside and they, want to like say you want to play with your friends and you want to play a shooting game you want to play call of duty you put on the glasses and you can go do that or you want to do rock climbing and you want to see what lines that rock has that's the future i want and that's the future that i'm, I'm trying to push every day with augmented reality and i i see it going there i think my fear is that the brand of augmented reality can get skewed where people do very quick um very effects. quick effects that don't have a lot of thought or energy into them besides how many millions of people I can get to use it, which I, I, I personally think is a trap. I think it, it hits our monkey brains. It makes us feel good. But at the end of the day, that's just a tech company trying to get you to give them more content. 
That's yeah. that's very true. I, I truly believe that we are very passionate about creating world ARs, the AR that really is educational, is entertaining at the same time. And it really takes a lot of time to create these type of AR. I know if you I, I don't know if you know, Alex has a template on Lens Studio. I think the template is called Gravity Gun, right? Yeah. Is it right? Yeah. It was yeah. It's, it's, it's great. I saw, I, uh, you know, the first time uh, when, I, when I connected with him, I saw that his name was on Lens Studio on a template. And I saw other people recreating using his template. They created bowling out of it. They created different. And it's, and it's great to see that there is a template which uses, you know, different features. And it's really, really powerful and engaging. Uh, how long did, you, did it take for you to create that uh, template, basically? And how did it come about? Because I really love that template. Yeah, sure. That was actually a project for uh, Snapchat. They wanted to make um, a video explaining how people can use the physics, but in an engaging way. They wanted it to be something that wasn't necessarily the traditional way that people use physics, where I think mm -hmm. people just put a bunch of balls and have them drop and they bounce drop, on the yes, floor, yeah. which is which is cool. Um, but I, I I think back. I don't know if you played Half Life Two. That's directly gravity where that gun, came from. Gravity Gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved that. When when I played Half Life Two, when I was uh, probably ten or twelve, that opened up my eyes. I was like, this is so engaging. It wasn't just the point and click, you know, where you have a gun and it shoots a straight line. You can. Yeah. What would that barrel do if I shot it? What would that? Yeah that buzzsaw do and it opened up sort of what we see with crafting in a lot of games yeah. now right where people mix and match things together so that was really the first example of physics being used as a weapon in a video game so i wanted to bring that back i think it's it's fun that ar is at its early stages the same way that video gaming was at its early stages when that came out in the early 2000s um so that was Definitely a labor of love. I would say it took longer than it probably should have, mostly because we were trying to make it multiplayer, which wow. it, yeah. we were this close to making it multiplayer, but we were having a lot of issues with the frame rate, with the, 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 uh, the box bouncing back and forth. I think if we were to go in now, um, there's a few things we could have done differently to work that out. Um, but we released the video and Snapchat came to us. They're like, hey, you want to make that a template? And template. we're like, yeah. all right, sure. Yeah, I mean, let's do it. Let's fucking do it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the fucking way to do it. Honestly, that's the way. Because you're not thinking about, oh, how many views can I get making this? You're thinking back to your childhood, your story. I like that gun. And I think it was creative. I feel like it's going to have the same effect on maybe newer generations who haven't played Half-Life. And now they get to see that in AR in a more interactive way because it's not behind a keyboard and a mouse. It's through your phone when you're outside. And so I find that to be actually the smart way to go about it because you're truly inspiring people as well with that template. Like you mentioned, yeah. it's not just a basic drop the ball and it hits the floor. Totally. And, and with Half-Life, after that gun came out, I have a, a video I can share with you, but there was like seven or eight other games that use the exact same exactly. mechanic, yeah. but just slightly different. And it's yeah. not ripping them off. It's not stealing their idea. It's iterating on it. And that's how this process should be. We should be sharing with each other. We should be yeah. iterating on top of the ideas with the focus of making augmented reality better and yeah. not just hoarding it for ourselves to try to get as many views as possible and just I love that. fearful that someone else is going to take our views from us. And how does it feel when you watch, because I saw you retweeting actually other people's creation out of your template. How does it feel when you open Twitter and you see other people using it? And sometimes, I mean, I don't know if it happens to you or no, they are more creative than you. Like the things that they make based on your template, they is add, way, on, top they of add it, on top of it, it's way better than yours. How does that feel? I, I would say that that was very challenging for me to get over my ego early on. When I was a creator by myself, before I started Mousepack, and I started hiring developers and hiring freelancers to help me, I was almost a little envious because they were better than me. You know what I mean? I'd been doing this yeah. for years and you know they come in in one month and they can outperform what I did. And, <laughs> and I, it took me some time. And once I got over that, I realized like, this is so much better to be inspiring people and to be helping people and lift them up 
um, that it, it really changed my whole perspective on being a director. And I, I can say that I'm very passionate about bringing people up right now. And when I see people on Twitter and they, they take my template and they, they change it to add bowling, I'm like, that's so creative and that's so clever. And I didn't think of that. And I love that you thought of that. And exactly I, I don't know how else to describe it other than I'm proud. Like, I'm just proud. Yeah, of yeah, no, that's, 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 that's amazing. That's beautiful. I mean, I know another example of that that I think a lot of people can relate to. Joe Rogan is one of the most famous podcasters and comedians because unlike probably other comedians, he doesn't have an ego. He actually gave platform to his own competitors, right, in the space, to other comedians. No one did that before him, right? I mean, maybe there were some, but not as 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 – to, to his scale, essentially. So for him to come and give his platform for free to bring other comedians up, to bring other people up, is essentially the reason now he's more famous than everybody else. Because he gave the love to everybody else and now he gets it back. And I generally believe in karma and I generally believe in all of that. It works in the business world. It works in relationships, in, in relationships, in everything. Now, and it's so important, especially in the AR world. I personally learned everything from templates and other people's work. There is no uni. No one is teaching this in college. People like you who create templates or create videos online explaining things. Yeah. That's how I learned. And that's how I we made this studio because there are people like you who are sharing their journey and other people are le learning from it. So I think that's super important. And I think that's one of the things that I really love about you. But I have a selfish question here. So <laughs> I was, no, because I was looking at your work for the past years and I went through your, you know, even motion design work. There is this strong, cute element in everything that you do and everything that you create. I personally don't have really a good UI design skill. I always rely on Faraz and Catalyst in our team. They are great at it. I want to know how do you come up with this? Because some of them, although it's two, three seconds, they are telling me a story. Like like the one with the shark and the jellyfish. The other one, there was a palm tree that was waving. Like, where does these things come from? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when I was an animator, I was very... Um... I really want to build a style. That's what every every artist wants to have is their unique style that people come to them for. So yeah. I, I really was interested in uh, child children's media. I made a, a video uh, called All the Nachos You Can Eat, which I can find that for you if you want on YouTube. <laughs> I would love but it to went see viral that. And, and I had all these people reaching out to me saying that their kids like won't go to bed until they watch the video five times. Um, so I, I, I was always really engaged with that. I, I don't like a lot of the dark, uh, the dark energy that I see in media with characters being murdered and blood and violence. I really felt like there's already way too much of that. So I decided to much. keep way too much. So my brand has always been focused on just pure good intentions, uh, you know what I mean? Like like fun characters. And, and there's a few design skills that I do with that. I would say I make giant big eyes um, and a big head. That's something that if you want to make something look cute, that's a quick little tip for you to do. And I've kept that style throughout all of my characters. I also have dis like the way that I do the colors are very bright and very fun. And I've just been doing it for so long that it's second nature. So when I talk to my team, I am the creative director. So I come in and I, I tell them, okay, that should be brighter. That should be a little bigger. That should be darker there. And the, there's a very unified uh, design language because of that. Okay, that, that perfectly makes sense. I, and I love the designs that you had before. And it's very, it's very I would say... I feel very calm to just look at them because I was going through them last night. It's, it's really nice to design. I absolutely Thanks, agree with Appreciate you. And I, and I think it's very important to develop your own unique style. I, I totally agree with you. I think that's every artist's dream. I personally haven't developed my own style yet in the 3D world. So it, it, I think it just comes through lots of inspiration and lots of practice over time, as you mentioned. It's something that you have to keep working on, and I think eventually over time you'll develop it. And Farad is definitely a big fan. He's, he's been following you of all, uh, all the art that you put out. Um, I want to sort of move this a little bit and talk about AI, because it is just something you can't ignore these days. It's, it's sure. popping up everywhere, and for good and bad reasons, right? 
we know that the the speed at which AI is traveling is faster than any other technology we've seen before with every single week seeing new updates, new softwares, and all of them honestly quite, well, most of them quite fascinating. First of all, before we even get started, I want to get your workflow. Do you have AI integrated in any of your current workflows for yourself or for your company? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, let's um, hear it. Let's hear it. I love it. <laughs> I would say that a lot of the 2D background elements that we've been doing, we re I'll actually show you really quick. Um, I would love to see it. A little secret for you. Let's see Yeah, it. let's this go. Is, this is a card oh, that we ooh. sent out to some clients, um, but it has a little train and a little uh, silhouette in the background. And right. on the back, we have a little QR code that leads to a web AR experience. Wow. But this was not done completely by AI, but I would say that it was AI assisted. So right. what, what that means is that I give, as a creative director, I tell my team, I have an illustrator and I said, mm -hmm. I would like a train moving towards the camera and a cityscape in the background. So mm -hmm. he took it upon himself to, you know what, I'm going to see what mid journey can help me with. So he, he showed me a few different iterations of that. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I like that style. Can we push that direction more? He pushed that direction and it spit me out five more images until we landed on one that we liked. And then we took it, brought that back into Illustrator, cleaned it up, put the logo wherever we wanted to, made sure that the lines were correct, got rid of some of the AI smudges or weirdness in it. And we have a wonderful product. That was exactly what I saw in my head when I wanted the product. And it was done way faster than if that illustrator was to go into sketch and then do another right. pass and then do all the little pen marks on it. It would have just taken forever. Right. Actually, I have well, that's that's amazing that you brought that up as an example. And I'm very curious because I feel like in a world where now AI is capable of taking a text and turning it into an image, how how do you feel like for a lot of illustrators out there, illustrators that work at your company or illustrators that are out there, maybe freelancing or maybe even college students who are learning illustration, what do you think they should be doing to up their skills? So if someone is an illustrator and wants to join your company, what is now your requirement to have them hired knowing that something like MeJourney is available? I would say that just in general, you need to keep up with technology. So I, like that. I can I can give an anecdote if you'd like. It's it'll please, be sort of a side tangent. So. so when at my first job at LinkedIn, there was a number of animators there were were you know in their forties and they had worked as traditional animators back in the day. Mm. Um, so right. think the original Disney films where you have to draw and then you flip to the next page yeah. and then you draw. draw again. And it was a very highly sought after job to be the lead animator. The person who draws the key poses so they draw this one and then they draw that one and then there was a bunch of people in between who were the in-betweeners so they had to go and draw here 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 and they got paid pennies right it was a very grueling job but it was you know they're doing animation and they're doing it out of the labor of love right and when toy story came out it destroyed the industry overnight. Suddenly, anyone could do it. Anyone could take a, a rig, a Buzz Lightyear, and a computer, and they do key one, key two, and then the computer does Blend all in. of that in between for you. So it caused a giant upset in the industry. There was these people being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to make these key poses, and they were being told, hey, People actually want 3D now. And they were like, I'm not going to learn a new program. I've been doing this for 30 years. And their jobs went away. And a lot of the people were faced with a very hard reality that they either learn the new technology or they retire. And a lot of them opted to retire. And that is where I see AI right now. I think it's here. It's not going away. And I think we all understand the implications of it. But at the end of the day, it's something that we just need to learn. It's a new reality. It's very similar from when we went to drawing on paper to computer animation. It's a new tool that does the work way faster. And we can see it as a blessing and not a curse. 
you can iterate way faster. You can come up with 20 ideas in a day instead of spending it on one idea. So at the end of the day, it really comes down to how do you use the tool and how do you solve problems with that tool? And I think people are going to be okay. If, if you know how to use it and you know the correct way to integrate it into your workflow, then it should be a wonderful blessing for you. I, I honestly, I, I love that answer. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more because there's a lot of voices out there talking about AI, but I think you put it perfectly. And the example that you gave is the exact thing that the exact same thing that are happening right now. It's just a different thing. Maybe the impact is a yeah. bit more. We have social media. Like I never heard that story because probably that time there was no one on social media to nag about it. Our no lifespans are about. so short that yeah. we yeah. forget history. And I think yeah. that's just, the key is just, it, this Look has already back. happened and this will happen again. And then in a hundred years, people are going to be mad that something else did this. It's just no, a no, no. human trajectory. It's not in a hundred years. I think the, the way technology is going, this will happen every 10 years now, right? We're going to have like these technologies popping up even more often. And just like you mentioned, the problem is people are not good at pattern recognition or they just don't read the history. And I love that you said that anecdote because... With that, like, again, the transition from 2D to 3D. And what's crazy is 2D wasn't destroyed. We still have 2D stylists who are phenomenal. They, 3D didn't replace 2D. It's just a lot of the, the upcoming work turned to 3D. But there are still 2D artists out there who do a phenomenal job and are paid more than a lot of the 3D artists. So one thing I want to say is, I mean, we make a lot of videos about, you know, different technologies. And some of them have been about AI. And unfortunately, what we see in the comments is a lot of AI haters. Yeah. Now, these happen. Yeah, I got to be careful. I wonder, am I going to get canceled? <laughs> like, <am> I <laughs> no, no, honestly, no. honestly, there's a lot of these comments. And, and it's surprising to me because I, I would initially think, you know, people would support this. But majority of the content we put out about AI, 50% are positives. 50% are negatives, which is quite high in terms of negatives, in my opinion, considering how much AI can actually help us. I'm talking, I'm not talking about all the negative political repercussions. I'm talking about actual mid-journey, right? I'm talking about chat GPT usage for artists. And it's crazy to me because the reasons they're giving is is just outworldly. I don't understand it. They're they're trying to defend something that doesn't exist. they if these artists, because they're 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 just mad of the fact that when I put out this video about mid-journey and I said, hey, I'm not good at sketching. That's what I said. I literally said that I'm not good at sketching. I'm a 3D artist, but I always sucked at sketching. And right now I'm using Midjourney to help me sketch out my idea. And then I'll create the 3D based on that. I'll iterate on top of it, of course, but I'll create something based on that sketch. And then some of the comments were like, look at this lazy guy who doesn't even want to learn sketching. Why don't you just put some effort into it? And I'm like, it's not about that. If I can use this technology to and speed up my process and be good at something that I it will take me like three years to get good at, I can then make a living out of it. I can pay for my family, pay for myself. It's helping me be a better person. Why do people hate on this technology so much? Well, I think I think people don't like when someone or something is better at what they thought they were good at. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I, I think I think people are scared at how good it is now. I think yeah. it it can you can spend ten years really honing in on a craft and getting really good at it. And I think a lot of people believe that as long as you sit and you're just doing the work and you're refining your craft, success will come. But in business, that's just not the reality. Yeah. You need to be able to be using tools to solve problems. And if someone has a problem and they say, hey, I want you to solve this problem for me. And you're like, sure, it'll only take three months of my time because I really have to sit in there. And then someone else comes and they said, well, I can do it in a week. Mm -hmm. You would think, well, their quality is not going to be as good. It's not going to be a good product. But then when an AI can spit something out and do it, better than what your product was way faster, they're going to go for the thing that was done well and fast yeah. because that's yeah. what is rewarded in business. And yeah. I, I think that's, that's a concept that people don't love. People don't, 
I, I don't really know how to word it because I'm trying <laughs> not to like, I don't want to come across that I'm, I don't understand where they're coming from because I had the same issue when I was working with developers and designers who were better than me. I had a feeling like, no, I've been doing this for years. I should be better than them because I've been doing it longer. But yeah. that's something you just have to get over and you have to figure out how can I use this to solve problems for more people, whether that problem is getting more um, donations for a nonprofit, getting kids to engage more with educational content, or if you're just a dirty capitalist and you want to make a bunch of money, you have to think yeah. about what is the best way to solve this problem. And that should That's be right. what you're focusing on. Yeah, no, 100%. I agree. And it's a reality that I think everybody has to deal with it sooner yeah. or later. But since we are discussing AI, I really want to talk about the whole ecosystem. I don't know if you guys know, Adobe just launched their new AI tool. It's called Adobe Firefly. So what happens in the Adobe suit, now you can have text to image generation and you can have text effects. You know, Mid Journey, OpenAI, OpenAI Dolly 2, they have problem with generating text within yeah. the image. Now imagine with Adobe, you can have text effects and you have text to image. And of course, it's all integrated to Photoshop and their other software suits. What do you think in the future that these big companies come to AI and they already have an ecosystem like Adobe, like Microsoft. And then there are companies who are coming in like Midjourney without any ecosystem and they are just an AI tool. How they can compete? Is it easier for you know Adobe-like to win? Because, hey, now you are in Photoshop. Why don't you give it a text prompt? Turn this dress to red and it's red. You don't need to go here, do the prompt, bring it back there. You, they have you, a base to begin with, Yes. Right? Yeah. I think it comes down to what is the simplest for people. So if people are already using Photoshop and they're already using the After Effects, if there is a plugin that is directly in those platforms that people can use, I think that's going to win. If yeah. someone has to go and go to a website and they have to download a plugin and then they have to download it in their folder and then drag it in, yeah. people are naturally just going to go for the path of least resistance. So I think it's smart that these companies are doing it and it makes sense. They're trying to get people to be more creative and come up with more ideas at a faster rate. And I think that's going to be the best way to go forward. I love that. Um, since we're slowly reaching the, the one hour mark, I do want to touch on one more thing with you because you shared this post about Unreal Engine Fortnite and we've been watching State of Unreal. We're crazy about Unreal Engine, you know, meta humans and all that. And being, we were in the Web3 space ourselves and knowing that everybody in the Web3 space wanted to make the next metaverse and failed at it. And now Unreal Engine and Fortnite are actually making a metaverse. You talked about this. We know the reasons why, but I want to hear it from you. You shared it and you said, I believe something like this is the metaverse. This is actually the metaverse. What makes you think that maybe you need to tell people that I've never heard about this and, and enlighten them about why this is so fucking big? Yeah. So I think what they're doing is they're testing and iterating the same way that I've, we've talked about AI, the same way that it went from 2D to 3D. What Fortnite did was brilliant. And I've been playing Fortnite. I play every morning with my brother, every single day. Uh, we just really enjoy the game. But what keeps me in there is that they're always updating it. Every few months, there's new weapons. There's a new theme. One week, it's cowboys. The next week, it's aliens. So they're just constantly updating it. And, and the way that they um, keep the, uh, the ecosystem going is they let people buy skins. So you're not paying to win. You're not paying for bigger guns or better weapons than other people that give you a competitive advantage. It's just what you look like. Are you LeBron James or are you Mr. Meeseeks? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really clever because a lot of games were falling into the trap of trying to do paywalls or you had to purchase a, a different level. So what Fortnite was focused on was getting people in and retaining them. A lot of video games, they want to come out with Call of Duty and then the next Call of Duty and the next Call of Duty because they're trying to make that 60 bucks every time a new game comes out. But Fortnite was just Tell focused on it, keeping man. that audience, growing that audience. And they got to a point where now they have all of these assets. They have all the cowboys. They have all the aliens, everything. And now they're saying, okay, cool. Now we're going to take 40% of all the money we've made 
over all the years and we're going to give it back to you. And also you can make your own maps in Unreal Engine and they port directly into that game. So it's brilliant because now you don't have to worry about creating the flow, how the characters move, how the guns work. You have an infinite option of all the different items that you want to use. So it's already made for you. The characters already work. There's already all the skins. So what they're allowing you to do is go into something that's familiar. All of these kids are playing in Fortnite every day. They understand it. They know how it works. And now they can just create whatever they want. So in a year time, I'm very excited to see what happens. I am very excited to see what people create, how kids are interacting. This is kids go on Fortnite. I was talking to some of my friends and they said that their kids come home after school and then they'll just go hang out in Fortnite. Like, which is yeah, like yeah. in some ways kind of sad. Like you want them to go outside and play with each other, but this is how the kids want to interact. This is, where this is what they want. And you know, people say, people, I'm not going to say we are old, but people at our age will say that, oh, they, they are missing out. They are not going out. They are not playing in the streets, but they don't want to. They yeah, lo- like, more fun. Like, like, they're they're more uh, fun. Trust me, there's more things to do in Fortnite than than outside when it was COVID, right? There's nothing to do outside. And you said it beautifully. There's a couple of things I need to fucking mention right now. These guys planned it out. And by these guys, I mean Team Sweeney, you know, the guys behind Unreal Engine, behind Fortnite, behind this whole Epic Games thing. They planned it out like Marvel planned out their movies. Like they they sat down many years ago, I imagine. They were like, you know what? This is the direction we're going. We need to make this into a multiverse, right? We need to plan out like Marvel did the movies. We need to bring these characters together versus DC. Even I, I love DC as well. But I mean, you know, the Marvel movies definitely made a much bigger hype, much bigger impact. And I feel like with 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 Fortnite, they and you can see that when they started the concerts, the Travis Scott concerts, all these concerts, because they they made Fortnite, they turned it into something more than a game. And someone coming from a mobile gaming background, I saw so many games copy that. The moment they had the concert, other games copied it. The moment they mm. had, you know, all these collaborations with Marvel, with DC, with all these different companies, with John Wick, they brought all the fucking skins and characters they could to make the game more fun. And on top of that... The game is made with Unreal Engine, my favorite engine, but the most beautiful engine when it comes to 3D, the best lighting, the, the using Nanite to bring in the highest poly of assets. And now they switched the game from Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5. So if that, that was a move they made before they you know, er, er, sort of released the editor so that it is updated with the latest graphics. And now they open it. To all the artists out there who are using Unreal Engine, hey, now you can, you know, make, make your own make and games come in here. Fortnite. And now yeah. it's open. Like you mentioned, you don't have to spend hours on rigging your character. The character's already rigged. You don't have to spend hours on the animation. And then you go and create, and then you can make money out of it. And then there's already a 500 million player base or something. Like, this is the metaverse that everybody was trying to fucking make last year that has already made. And honestly, I don't see it, the point of having a competitor to this because it's such a good product. Like it's already amazing. And people If are... you've ever played the game too, it just flows so well. They've been refining the movements for years. They've been iterating on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you think about it, like if you want to make a game where you have a crossbow, they have six different types of crossbows for you. And say you want to have it where you shoot a crossbow and it it explodes into fireworks in the sky. They have a boombo that explodes like with an explosive, but then you could just change what asset comes out of it. And so it's yeah. brilliant. It's like all of the, it's a t- it's essentially templates. They set yeah. up all the templates throughout the years and now people can go in and edit small things here and there and craft whatever they want. Yeah. Alex, any plan on creating a map in Fortnite anytime soon? <laughs> you know, I have you look to so see excited. if the business, if the business can can take some time off and learn it, then we'll do that. But we right should, now we should, we're, we're, we should we're do focusing something. on AR. We should do something. I feel like, I mean, for us, it's the same thing. It's it's definitely going to take some time. But I think if you are interested, we should totally find something. Let's, out let's build something. a map together. Why not? As, as a side project, that's going to be dope. There's one thing, though, that will only complain because I saw Matt Workman. He makes a lot of Unreal Engine videos and he's an amazing YouTuber. 
he talked about him using UEFN and the only issue he had was verse. The fact that he's used to visual scripting using blueprints, but if you're creating for Fortnite, you have to sort of use verse. So I don't know any coding. And for me, that's going to be sort of an issue. I hope they consider bringing blueprints and not going too heavy into verse so they allow people to still use blueprints. So I feel like a lot of people still rely on the visual scripting. I'm not, I'm not sure about you. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I don't know anything about coding, but I luckily have a really talented team that, that like I said, they can bounce around from any platform and figure things out. Um, so I think over time, it's just going to get easier and easier. This was just announced, what, like a month ago, less? Yeah. So over the course of a few years, it's, it's only going to get simpler and simpler for people to use. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I love talking to you, man. That yes. I, I just I appreciate you being here, being our second guest on the podcast and bringing so much value. I feel like this stuff that we touched on, it helps so many people find answers. And that's what we want to do on this podcast as well. We want to talk to people who've done it, who've you know went through the hard mountains and climbed some of the rocks that people are waiting to climb. And you've done that. And we appreciate you sharing that workflow, the process, because it definitely helps people out and i just want to say from me personally from farrah and everybody watching i appreciate your time cool yeah you guys are doing an amazing job i love the clips that you guys put out with the video i i think it's such an engaging way to connect with people and to teach people things so hey i'll come back you want me on for, yeah, a for sure break round 100%. Two? We'll dive into something percent. else. I'm down. There's, there's one that you need to have. Co I, we need to ask you to bring your coffee next time with you, so that we're drinking coffee together in the beginning. And, and Alex, I want to. I want to tell you something. This is. This is. This is. I would say way more personal. You have so much energy, and you have such a good storytelling skills that I think you should start creating content. Like the way. Like I. You came on this podcast. I. I could say if I didn't know you, I would say this is your hundredth experience telling your story and doing content. Like you definitely should do it. You have the energy. Yeah, I, you... I appreciate that, man. Yeah, that's actually a conversation we're having right now. This this personality is what I've been using to go out and get jobs and do song and dance in front of clients. But yeah, I plan to bring this, I plan to be putting out more content. It just comes down to um, yeah, what well, I'm focusing on at the company. <laughs> like what, I know, I, I, hundred percent. It's tough. It's tough. You know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. But what I'm saying is, you already have it. You have like, the charisma. You have sure, the charisma. Yeah. You have the character. Go for it. I just want to ask one more thing, Alex, for everybody who's uh, watching the podcast. How can they follow you or Mousepack? Where should they go? And is there anything they need to look forward to? And also, if you have anything you want to say to them, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Just Look up Alex Brat and you'll see my smiling face. Also on Twitter at Alex Brat. Um, you can go to mousepack.com if you want to see some of our project breakdowns. And the what I would encourage people to do is just try to make what you see in your mind come to reality. And if you hit roadblocks, try to find people that are also working on this and try to collaborate together. There's no room for ego, and especially in an industry that is constantly changing and constantly adapting, you need other people to help support you. That's beautifully beautiful. said. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Alex. For everybody, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Bad Decisions Coffee Break. We'll be back again next week with another guest. We won't say who it is yet. No, that's a surprise. Right? Yeah, well, it's going to be a fucking surprise, but thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys on the next fucking episode. And make sure you have coffee as well, all of you guys watching next See episode. See you guys next week. Ciao.